in Vietnam, and um, he is the Francis Epps Professor of English at Florida State. And he may not be a giant physically, but he's a literary giant. Mm -hmm. And he has a giant literary foot footprint. Among his works are 12 novels, Alleys of Eden, Some Dogs, Country, Countrymen of Bones, On Distant Ground, Wabba. I'm not gonna, it's wrong line. If you, by the way, FSU needs to update. 16 now. In 1993, Bob was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. So, um, for his sh short story collection, A Good Scent from a Strange Mountain. Okay. And just as a, an aside, as a writer, uh, as a journalist for a long time, every year that the police surprises come out, I get depressed. <laughs> <laughs> My name is not on the list. And, you know, and so, but that's why I keep working because it, it's, one, one, it's one thing I'd love, love to have. He's also a National Book Award winner for fiction. Um, he's also written screenplays for Hollywood major studios, and he is a writer. Writer. This is a group of people who want to write. Right. Not they don't want, want to talk write. about writing too much, but they want to write, and 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 they believe that you know here they'll walk away with something today that that they can use tonight when they sit. Good. First thing is that before I started writing well and began to publish books that I'm happy to stand by, I wrote twelve god-awful full-length plays. I, I thought, I started off wanting to be an actor, and then I decided I wanted to be a playwright, and I was a terrible playwright. Um, I should have known better. My most impassioned writing was going into the stage directions. That's a very bad sign for a playwright. You know, that is a closeted fiction writer is what that is. Then I, but I, I finally realized I wanted to write fiction, but then I wrote, and my grad student has been doing my papers, so we, we got an exact count. 44 dreadful short stories what, four collections worth, and five terrible novels. None of this got published. A million words of bull poop. <laughs> Before something turned in me, I started writing well. But in spite of all of that, and then 22 books since, I took two weeks off this novel, and I know those characters intimately. You know, I know. I have a sense of what's going to happen next. It has been 10 days of agony to get back into it. And one of the reasons that somehow this got overlooked was there, you, you have to understand the distractions in your life. And, and the internet is a blessing. My last <laughs> several books have been set in 1914, 1915. I should be dedicating these books to Google. <laughs> really, you know, really. But today, I've gone, holy, is this the end of my career? You know, I've, I've really, this is, this is terrible getting back into this novel. All right, last day I said, I've got, I'll turn everything off. Well. <laughs> All right. But, you're but this is perfect. But it, it, it's it's happened because the writing every day thing is a very serious matter. Don't you know? You, you've got to you've got to figure out how to do that. No matter what kind of writing. I do a lot of sports analogies because ath athletes and writers train the same way. They have regimens the same way. When I say for fiction writers, you have to get out of your head, you have to stop thinking, and you have to write from the place where you dream, as Andrew mentioned. It's the same as the athlete zone. I watched Tiger Woods, an ache for him. I adore this guy. But man, you can, you know, when you redo your, your, your basic swing, your, your muscle memory goes out the window. You have to train your muscles again. And when, he's, when he goes off and his impulse to, to get very upset when he misses a shot, he goes from here to here. You can just watch him thinking. You know, it, it's that mechanism that you have, and it's, and it's for all good writing. You know, it's, it's that intuition, it's the, it's the writer's equivalent of muscle memory, and for a writer of literary fiction is working from their deepest, uh, often forgotten, personal experience from their unconscious, you know, 
that's 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 deep muscle memory, and that's that's the stuff that drives what goes on to the page. So the minute you get self-conscious and start thinking about it, nobody's smart enough to write a novel from the, from the analytical faculty. It's not a good one. The sad thing is, this is how you get taught to. Not right. taught to write. In, it's how you've been taught to read. Mm -hmm. You know, reading needs to be, a, especially fiction, a natural experience. You're not meant, in a work of fiction, to understand it in an abstract, analytical, theoretical, philosophical, <laughs> thematic, ideational way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not meant to. In in the first and only necessary encounter with the text, you are meant to thrown to a work of fiction, especially literary fiction. Thrum, like the vibration on the string of a stringed instrument. Huh? You thrum to it. But in all of the ways we're all teaching our children to read, our, our college students to read, this gets worse the higher you go. The attitude is often intentional, that the writer is sort of like an idiot savant. You know, that, like, that, that guy in Rain Man, the Dustin Hoffman, you know? <laughs> he's an idiot, but he's got this special kind of, you know, talent. That the writer is really that kind of an idiot, but, is, but he can produce these objects. But what he really means to do is to say these abstract, analytical, theoretical, philosophical, academic things. Can't quite do it. That the work doesn't, you know, when you sit down in the, in the classroom and they say, okay, what does this story mean? As if just the reading of it did not give you a kind of innate, instinctive meaning. It has to be translated into these ideas. It's nonsense, folks. Total nonsense. I'm, in fact, they're often saying in classrooms, <clears throat> What is the author trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Trying. Hasn't said it yet. No. Not until we turn it into something else. Turn, it turns into ideas and abstraction, you know. This is total nonsense. <laughs> and, but that's how we've been taught to read. That's why my writers arrive and then in workshops and, you know, um, especially structured workshops in universities. You know, I've got PhD students in my fiction workshops. They've got MFAs already from the University of Iowa and all these places. They know the second through the ten things about being an artist and they don't know the first thing about it. Which, which, is, which is this. They're all right from their heads. Their writing workshops have done the same thing. Writing workshops you know, where everybody sits in a circle. And I, I hope I'm not going to step on your toes here. We all read each other's work and yeah. give each other advice. You know, it's the blind leading the potentially sighted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, your criticism is ridiculously overrated. <laughs> I love it. It feels One reason is that you, whenever you read your fellow writer's work, you open up, you put that thing in front of you, and even if you're well-intentioned, and there are plenty of bad intentions possible in this circumstance, <laughs> and there's plenty of currying favor with the impressive, you know, published writer in the room who you want to impress with your, your critical acumen, and usually that writer is even grading you on that in the university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting there with a the thing you're supposed to thrum to, but you start reading it from the first sentence going, what am I going to say? <laughs> as soon as you do that, you go from here to here. <laughs> and you and there's and you stop reading. I mean, there's nothing you can say that is reliably correct about it. You see the problem? So um, you know, that's that's the, the message that I, I bring here in this book. Um, and, and it's the primary message I have to bring to my students. That art does not come from the mind, it comes from the place where you dream. And there's an interesting, there's an interesting 
precedent for this. And what I'm about to say does not have any necessary theological implications. So you may have a theological spin on this as well, and that's fine. But it doesn't have to be. That the center figure in one of the great religions of the world, in books most closely written about him, and he dealt with the same big issues that artists do. A work of literary art, a work of, of important writing. And by the way, I'm, I, I, we can talk about the other kinds of genres too. Liter literary fiction is just one genre. And there's importance to those as well. But I'm talking about this particular genre. But it deals with the big issues. What are we here? What, what's the meaning of the human condition? And this guy dealt with those questions, all theologians. And the books most closely written about him said that he did that one way. How? You want to know what the kingdom of heaven is? Well, there was a guy who owned a vineyard. He had a son. He was just, he had to put it into specific narrative, into concrete story, parables, yes. There's even that wonderful scene, I don't remember which book it's in, where he's just done this to a bunch of folks and he gets in the boat, with his, goes out of the Sea of Nazareth, and Peter's there, the first literary critic. I love Peter. The first academic. He said, hey, that was fine for them, Jesus, but what did that really mean? It's like the guy in the, liter in the, in the literature classroom. What did the author try to say? Exactly. What does it mean? Translate it into abstraction. Jesus gets pissed off. <laughs> He's pissed too, but Jesus gets even more pissed. He says, let those who have ears hear. He does not say, let those who have a brain think. Exactly. <laughs> He does not say that. The great jazz trumpeter Miles Davis, who was a very political man, he had lots of strong ideals about his art. He says, man, you don't play what you know, you play what you hear. Play what you hear. That's, you know, the one of the first and most important things I have to tell my students. Now, they're not doing this. Almost, virtually none of them is doing this when they first come to me. They've been taught that it's all a process of the mind from the way they learn to read and the way they've learned to write. But that's also very comfortable because for the literary writer and for the serious memoirist and for a lot of even the other genres where you approach crime novels or romance novels, with a, a, a serious intent, realizing that romance and crime and war and, and, and the fears of things in the night, that these things are all tapping into major elements of the human condition, you know, that, that, the, that that focus has to be in, in the into the unconscious. And as soon as that happens though, you see, one reason that this is hard for everybody is that what's there is scary as hell. Mm -hmm. exactly. The great Japanese film director, Akira Kurosawa, once said, to be an artist means never to avert your eyes. To be an artist means never to avert your eyes. You cannot flinch, you cannot look away. And if you go into this really hot place and you do not flinch, that is very scary and you're very vulnerable doing it. And that's why when it, you're given an opportunity or an encouragement to write not from here but from here, you do it because this is safe. Yes. Yes. This is safe. It's, it's why if you've got a two or three hour writing day, or even an hour and a half, whatever it is, it's those other 22 hours that's the problem. Because once you go there and you've got the courage to do it and you make yourself vulnerable and you write from there, what happens when you walk out of your writing room door? How do you get that 
door closed. Mm -hmm. That's what this, that's that's the challenge, and that's why a lot of folks convince themselves that this is okay or that this is really this. It's not. Um, language is our medium, of course, but there are some other things. First of all, all fiction is about human beings. My students know that. Um, even when the main character is a giant cockroach or <laughs> is in Kafka. Or I, wrote a, I wrote a short story once. My most anthologized story is called A Jealous Husband Returns in Form of Parrot. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> the other thing that we that fiction inevitably is, it's not only uh, that's about human beings, no matter what the character seems to be. It's about human feeling. Yes. Even my students are right from their heads, abstracting and generalizing and summarizing and so forth, in that sort of way that's indicative of writing from the head. What they're abstracting and analyzing is our feeling, so they know that. But there's another thing, and they miss this. Fiction is a, what they call it, is a kind of, is a temporal art form, that is, it exists in time. Poems can be set apart from time. You can write a poem about a chair and just kind of move around. It's not about human beings, clearly, or, you know, and there's no sense of the passage of time. They're, they're objects on the page, but when you let the line length run on and you turn the page, you are, as they say in the old tales, upon a time. Mm -hmm. And any Buddhist can tell you, and this is one of the great truths of their religion, that you cannot exist on planet Earth for even a 30 seconds of time as a human being with feelings. Those are the other characteristics of fiction. Without desiring something. Mm. Desire. We are always wanting something on some level. Mm -hmm. I prefer the word yearning because it suggests the deepest level of desire, and that deepest level is where fiction gets to, literary fiction. Fiction, inevitably, is the art form of human yearning. And, and that's what makes narratives go. That, that, that technical characteristic of plot, for example. Plot is simply yearning, challenged and thwarted. Problems is the thing that you see the most of that, um, that has the fulsome appearance of being sufficient for a narrative. It's not enough for a character to have problems or a big problem because ultimately, you know, sort of implicitly, um, anyone with a problem desires not to have the problem, but that is not sufficient to carry a narrative. Basically, if you've got a problem, you've got a character who is passive, who's, in this, who's basically just passive in the center, receiving something. It has to be the dynamic of wanting something that makes narratives go, okay? And that's the thing that um, is missing from virtually every student manuscript I've ever seen before they get into my clutches. Yes? Okay, you talk about um, when you go to your subconscious, that dark place, that hot spot. Um, because a lot of times when I'm writing, I, I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my editor would say, what, something right there, you, you stopped. I mean, does that mean I'll never be a good writer? <laughs> I mean, can I, can I, can I go, can I be all right, even if, because like you said, it's scary and maybe I'm not ready and maybe I need to. Well, if you're trying to write literary fiction, serious fiction, uh, you got to do it. That doesn't mean you have to do that. There are plenty of, I mean, you know, look, um, one of the problems may be you're dealing with characters that you're dealing too close to literal memory. Mm -hmm. The great 
British novelist Graham Greene once said, all good novelists have bad memories. <laughs> he says, what you remember comes out as journalism. What you forget goes into the compost of the imagination. No compost heaps, yeah? So, um, it might be that, that if you're writing fiction, and I'm writing You're, romance too. So it's yeah. So you you may be you may be too directly accepting and even trying to reference specific things that happen to you. The literary object is a very complex thing, and it's organic, meaning every little thing resonates into everything else. So there's two problems. One problem is if you're writing from your literal memory, you know, you uh, Graham Greene could have said that that what you remember comes out as therapy as well. I mean, you know, that's too much, it's too close to your, and therapists, the, you know, therapists actually do want to get your literal memories out to vent them off. But that's another thing. Because then they are what they are, and that's important. You've got to make sure that, that, that this intense white hot thing in you that is real, that you remember concretely or, or help to remember, it, it you, you, the importance is to remember it as nearly as, as you can as it happened and, and not let it change into something else because that's the problem with, with emotions is that the thing that happens to you that's traumatic gets dissolved and get, then resurfaces in inappropriate, indirect ways. So that's therapy. But the artist, the artist, the art object, trying to get at a deeper truth than just personal, that how it happened to me, true, trying to give you a vision, everybody a vision of the human condition. The object you create relies on the ability to make every tiny thing fit together. And if there is something literal, real in the memory sitting there, it won't yield. You know, if you sit in those workshops of the blind leading the potentially sighted, you're going to get a lot of, when you say something critical, the person receiving the criticism will often say, well, that, that's how it really happened. Like, oh, that explains why that criticism's wrong. Well, that's because, yeah, you know, it happened that way and you can't really budge it off of that. So, as far as the object is concerned, it's a problem. And, and as far as, um, you know, just the, the personal thing, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So you've got to let it, but that doesn't mean once it dissolves that, you know, you're working with the material that causes neurosis and psychosis as well, and bad behavior. You're dealing with the things indeed that really happened, but that have been forgotten, or at least dissolved, or you're putting them aside. But they're redirected into stories about characters that allows all of us to come into that, that piece of fiction and see what the human condition is all about. You know? Does that make sense to you? So, yeah, you've got to get past that to be a good literary writer. But the problem might be simply that, it's not so simple, but you've got to, you've got to let go of the things. You're, ref you're letting yourself refer too directly to what really happened to you. Does that make sense? Did you have a question? I think that, that kind of answered it. I, I asked about 11 questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's like, well, if you decide to let yourself go to this particular place, how do you know that you're ever coming back? You know, um, in, in some places, um, some yeah. Writers the, don't. Hmm? Yeah, some writers don't. Right, correct. David Foster Wallace didn't, you know? Of course, he never went there. That was part of the problem. He wrote, <laughs> he wrote too much from his head to start with. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's fine. Right. Your question, no, no. yes. So, the, but that was it. So you, you you're saying to be this, you know, you got to embrace your tad bit of madness that you might have to be this great artist. But at the same time, you know, what if you go too far and then you no longer, you're no longer able to deal with reality per se, where some of us are weirdos anyway. Yeah. I and. Know. Um, no, that's a danger. You get that? It's certainly a danger. But I, honestly, for you to be able to sit there and frame the question, I think is, I mean, I think the people who really have danger, who are in serious personal danger from that, are the ones who, who don't even question it. Question. Oh, so I can go there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, I can, so I can go there. I'm not making any commitments. <laughs> I'm just saying, are you 
coming with me? Are you coming with me? Draw your own conclusion. <laughs> it's okay. all in your hands. Yeah. Thank you. When you're talking about writing from your internal spot, going to your head, writing from your head, how do you know that you've changed from one to the other? And how do you redirect yourself back? I mean, yeah. consciously. I actually am able to work my sentences over. I write a sentence, and I go to the next sentence, and by the end of that second sentence, the one before it, I go, who the hell wrote this? You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, not quite literally, but I'm, I do, I am, I can, you know, I have to deal with that. I can deal with my sentences one at a time. Um, and, and work my sentences over as I go. But other writers feel like they need to, or, or their memories are such that they have to get a rough draft down, and then they go back and then re-encounter what they've written some days or weeks even, mm -hmm. some even months later. You, you re-engage your own work like a good reader, and you just go thrum, 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 twang. Right. Now the twang is where you fell out, probably, okay? So what you have, what you do is when it twangs, you go back and the passage that twanged, you redream it. You revisit the place in your unconscious to redream the passage. You apparently, basically, don't look at it; just re redream it. Right on. Exactly, and don't treat a really good phrase in the middle of that. As if it were like literal memory. I mean, in the sense that, oh, I've got to preserve that. Let me stick that in and make sure it's safe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's good only if it's really good only if it works in the in, organically in the context. So remember then that rewriting is redreaming. How, how did you experience in Vietnam in the shape of some of your books? Well, um, the primary way it shaped, and of course, you know, a lot of writers have gone to war. And one of the things about war is that it heightens your senses. I mean, and any trauma, any life experience that's difficult heightens your sensual self. And the artist is, a, is a, artists are not intellectuals, artists are sensualists. And I fell instantly in love with the Vietnamese people and their culture and the landscape. And, and I was in circumstances where I was not a combat soldier and I was able to have a lot of close contacts with Vietnamese people. In intelligence, I worked with farmers and woodcutters and fishermen and provincial police chiefs. And then I, our unit stood down. I spent seven months then working in Saigon City Hall, where I was the uh, translator and administrative assistant to the American Foreign Service officer who was the advisor to the mayor of Saigon. I worked in a civilian closed job in Saigon City Hall, lived in an old French hotel, my favorite thing in the world, every night for seven months. I would um, wander alone, unarmed, into the steamy back alleys of Saigon, where nobody ever seemed to sleep. Talk about heightening your senses. <laughs> and um, I would, and the, I would crouch in the doorways with people, speak to them. They were delighted I spoke Vietnamese. They were warm and generous spirited people. Inevitably, they'd invite me into their homes, into their culture, into their lives, and so. I learned all about them, but more importantly, I learned about all of us from all of them. Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, it was profoundly shaped uh, my writing. And certainly, of the 22 books, about six of them draw largely or solely or specifically on all of that. But you know, it's just part of part of the unconscious. And so, because they are as human as we are, and that, that I mean, that's the other thing. I think the artists. Creed, what we do as, as writers of this sort um, is, to, is to remind the world that the things that seem to divide us, race, gender, ethnicity, religion, um, you know, all of these things, religion, these things that seem to be so important to divide us are not nearly as important as the thing that unites us, which is our shared humanity. Yes. You know? Yes. So that's you know that's and that's 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 how that affected me there. And if you're writing about social issues, Jonathan Swift once said, you cannot reason a person out of a position that he didn't reason himself into in the first place. <laughs> 
And if you're right from your head, even if your ideas, even if your social consciousness is absolutely, beautifully, absolutely true, the thing you create will only be able to talk to people who already agree with you. <laughs> Art gets past that. If you come to a work of fiction and you get involved in the story and this character's yearnings and you see what the consequences are, but you don't see it with, with the author coming in and pointing out the social, social point, you're drawn in. And if, you're, if your emotions are not to understand that social issue, if that work is talking in an abstract way, ultimately, I'm not going to get it. But if I visit that with my heart and with my unconscious, I might. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Like, you know, what's political about Shostakovich's Symphony Number no. 4? Or about a Cezanne painting? Well, Joseph Stalin knew he knew more than any English teacher at any university. He understood. If you listen to that, you, if you listen to that symphony, man, you know that's going to undercut my political authority because it changes you from the place where emotions, where politics are really held. Because all politics are emotional, folks. Mm -hmm. White knuckles. Highly. Yes. Shortness of breath. Yes. You hear it. You turn on the TV tonight. It's all emotion. No one has come to a strongly felt political position by objectively, objectively reasonably looking at both sides of the argument Never. and then coming to this conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you a different type of question. Um, how many editors have you been through through your career? Right. And what is your, you know, what is your relationship with your editor, and how hard is it to edit? You? Um, I've been through a lot of editors, a lot of agents uh, as well. Um, um, you know, 22 books, I've been with, let's see, there was Horizon Press, and then there was uh, Knopf, and then there was Simon & Schuster, and then there was Henry Holt, and then there's Grove Atlantic, and now I have, I'm within a set, some of my books are coming up with a, from Mysterious Press, which is a sub thing in Grove. So that's, is that six Seven. major imprints, mm -hmm. and uh, with several editors each place, and you know, and then there's magazine editors and so forth. Uh, so a lot of editors. Um, since um, I've been lucky with my editors, and I've also been lucky in my, writing my million words of awful stuff uh, before, that, that didn't get published. So I had to deal, um, you know, by the time I got to editors, um, I, I, you listen to them, and, so, and what if you're lucky you get an editor who knows how to throw and twang, okay? And I've, had, I've been lucky in that respect. And they give you notes, and if, and most good editors at the level that I'm d dealing with now, you know, their attitude is these are just suggestions and, you know, see which ones make sense to you and which don't. It's your call at the, at the end of the day. Now, you know, getting started and, and again, the higher you go in the food chain, the better that situation gets, the more respectful they are. The look at the low end, people are just as inept as editing as some you know, as, as, as people are writing. So you've got to always hear an editor's suggestions um, as a, as a, um, as a suggestion. See what makes sense to you, even from from, from my level, from our level. Um, because you need to pick, you need to be careful about who you get suggestions from How do you at pick? your level. How do you pick? Needless someone? to say, but, but but yeah, you need to pay more attention until you until you have written enough that you you're able to edit yourself in a way, you know, and, and you can be confident in that. I'm at the point where okay, um, I read your book and. Um, where you gave feedback 
on the students. Mm -hmm. And um, I have an editor who is editing me that way, and it's not the easiest thing. Right. Um, you know, so it's, it gets to a point where you wonder, am I even ready to do this? Am I, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I mean, do you get, have you been there and how did you get to the point where you are at this point where it's just suggestions and, and you, you take it yeah. or you leave it and you're still comfortable putting it out there? Well, you know, I didn't, sh I didn't, I, my own experience is uh, anomalous because I never got to editors. I had a million words of all that stuff that just got rejections. I didn't have any. Okay. I, I never had anything that published mm -hmm. until I started publishing after I really knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a problem. And now there's so many, ironically, there's only, and, and the internet age has, has increased this. A, a, a lot of what I wrote that I recognize now was awful would have been published much of it before. Was it you know, and I, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, the reason, you might ask yourself, why does somebody write 44 short stories and five novels that don't get published over a period of a decade and keep writing? Why, why is it three novels and out? You know? <laughs> and and the, the, the thing that protected me, ironically enough, was self-deception. I thought I was a lot better than I really was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then, by the time um, that um, I got the right kind of nudge from a, a writing teacher, and it was just a nudge. I was able to go into the right place in myself, and I had I had put in as much work as I needed to to be ready to write well. You know that book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah. You, you know that book? He says that anybody who does any complex task at a, at a level of, of high accomplishment often called genius or whatever. They seem to spring naturally to there, but no. Every person who does anything at any great level of accomplishment has put in 10,000 hours of, of work toward that. And I went back and did a kind of rule of thumb, and by golly, that million words took 10,000 hours to write. You know, an athlete never understands never misunderstands that reps, thousands and thousands of reps are necessary for the one rep that counts in a game. And so I did my, I did my 10,000 hours before I dealt with editors. And so by the time I got to editors, and I got fortunately to a good editor, my, and yet my first really good novel was turned down 21 times. Mm. But I, the one that finally got published and, and deserved to be published, and I, I believe in today, and went on to get 21 enthusiastic reviews, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, any one of those editors would have been a bad editor because they didn't see the virtue in publishing. Or some did have made a marketing decision. It was a Vietnam novel which got published in 1981, which was way close to. The, what was, you know, an awkward defeat. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't, so I can only tell you, you keep asking in terms of personal experience, I would suggest it's, it's a way of balancing your own sense of knowing who you are and what you need and what you feel you're still weak in and listening to an editor and see if they are saying to you things that you, when you go back and thrum and twang to your own work, if they're hearing the same twangs you do, you listen to what they're saying. If they are twanging to your thrums and thrumming to your twangs, you, it, you know, don't be afraid to say, you know, we're, we're just not on the same page on this story. I don't mean we're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, 
Been so long, I forgot my question. <laughs> Hey, this, did, I, did I mention Graham Greene? Uh, I, think you got, I think you got promise there. Different type of question. Uh, writing feels like it really, whether well, it is a selfish act, it's really deeply personal, at least for me it is. How do you balance That's that? selfish, self-absorbed self maybe? No, I'm selfish, I like my writing. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and that leads to the next question. Yeah. So are, are you really writing for your audience or for, or for the people that are gonna get your material by your books? Or are you just write it and put it out there and let it kind of be up on its own? Well, the latter, in a certain form of the latter is crucial for, for your well-being and for your ability to write uh, from your unconscious. Because if you start thinking about your audience, what are they going to expect? And, and even more, what's an editor going to expect? What's a publisher want? That's going to, a lot of those million words of crap that I wrote uh, were shaped badly by that, you know? That, that I was trying to, at some point, got so fed up with the, all the rejection that I was, mm. I was trying to, be, well, what do they want? Um. As soon as you do that, your ability to write like this is gone. You know? So um, you, write, you write serious writing. And, and we haven't talked about some of the other genres yet. I'm happy to do it. But you all, a lot of you seem to be interested in this, this genre. That's great. But, um, but this genre, at least, you, you you cannot let anything um, interfere with your the reason you're writing, which is that this writing is an absolutely sensual thing. It's of the moment, of the senses, not of the mind. The thing is, as being creatures of the body and of the moment, there's one thing that all of our, our religion and our philosophy and our psychoanalysts and our grandmas reassuring words that if they do not fully work and they don't always at the time uh, buffer you that what your impression of planet earth is is that that it's all chaos that there is no control of anything now the nascent artist the beginning artist the artist who is person who's going to be an artist believes that well you know i've got this feeling this intuition that behind that apparent chaos there's order and the only reason that, and, and, and we, I share that with a lot of folks, theologians and philosophers and psychoanalysts and, and scientists, you know, but they're all happy to understand that vision of order and express it in abstraction. Theological dogma and philosophical principles and scientific laws and so forth. I can't do that. The only way I know to express what I see is to go back to the way it happened to begin with, through the body, in the senses, in the moment, pull out bits and pieces, reshape them into these narrative objects, which when you then read it, you will thrum to, you'll hear the big meaning behind the parable without having to say what that really meant. Okay? And so, you know, for that, yes, you have to write for yourself. Because it's your vision of the universe that is, that is given to you. Yes. And then you will say it in the terms that you have been given to say it in. And that, that's the primary thing. Now, needless to say, the fact you're saying it means you want to communicate to somebody. You don't just write your own language and gibberish or whatever. But if you stay true to who you are and to your own voice mm -hmm. and not try to be somebody you're not, and recognize that who you are is the most important thing, yes. precisely who you are, mm -hmm. then you'll be fine.